Okay, we can summarize what we learned now in a few sentences. First of all, a recursive function is equivalent to a while loop if it is tail recursive. That means if the last operation performed in the function body is the recursive call. Second of all, to write functions in this way, we have to use an accumulator, an argument which gathers the result. Little by little, it ends up with the final result. We can find the accumulator starting from an invariant. Now remember the invariant formula we used in sum of digits and in the factorial. And once we have the invariant, we use the principle of communicating basis so that the one part of the invariant is decreasing less and less work and the other part is increasing and gathering the result of the other parts of the accumulator. So this approach is called invariant programming. And in fact, it's the only reasonable way to program loops. Uh, I've shown one reason today that the stack size is constant. In fact, there are other reasons, very important reasons, and we will see another very important reason once we start using doing data flow concurrent programming. But that's for much later in the course, so let me not get too much ahead of myself. One comment I would like to make is that the same approach, invariant programming, is used to write while loops in imperative languages. Uh, languages where variables can be assigned multiple times, such as Java, C++, Python, and so on. So the, the fact that you're obliged to use the invariant programming approach to get an efficient program in the functional paradigm is not, in fact, a disadvantage of the functional paradigm with respect to imperative paradigms. It's simply the correct way to do loops in either paradigm. Uh, the only real difference between the two paradigms in this case, uh, for the case of loops, is the syntax of the loop, how it is written. Uh, it either uses a while keyword in an imperative language, or it looks like a tail recursive function. But in fact, both of them are, in fact, equivalent. Now we have seen two examples that use invariant programming. We've seen sum of digits, and we've seen factorial. But both of those examples are kind of simple. Uh, they're good to introduce the ideas, but they don't really show the power of the technique. The power of the technique really shows up when we do more complicated kinds of calculations. So let me give another example now, which really shows the power. In fact, let me define the power function, which is x to the exponent n, uh, 2 to the 10, which is 1024. Let me start by making the specification of this function the mathematical specification. So this specification says that x to the power 0 is equal to 1. Now we're assuming x is different from 0. And the second rule is x to the power n is equal to x times x to the power n minus 1 when n is bigger than 0. OK, that's the mathematical specification. Remember again that there's nothing regarding programming languages in that specification. It's purely mathematics. There's no programming language keyword whatsoever. Okay. Now we can translate this specification into a program. Let me make now a simple program, POW1, x to the n, that follows the specification. So if n is equal to 0, then the result is 1. Otherwise, it's x times pow 1 x to the n minus 1. Okay, this definition follows the specification pretty closely. Now let me run it to show you how it works. 2 to the 10, oops, 2 to the 10 is 1024. Okay, now this function is very simple, but in fact has two problems. It uses way, way too much calculation and memory to do the work that it does. So the first thing, clearly, it's not tail recursive. Okay, the last operation in the function body here is multiplication. But there's another reason why this is a very inefficient function. And to show this other reason, let me show you a simple example. Let me try to do x to the power 16. How many multiplications does this take using POW1? Well, I'm going to be doing recursive calls over and over again for 16, 15, 14, 13, and so on. So this takes 
16 multiplications using power one. The last one is only by one, but still it takes 15 multiplications that are doing real work. But I can have another technique that uses much quicker. Let's try x squared. Let's now take x squared and square it again. Okay, let's now take x squared, which has been squared, and square that again. And let's do it a final time. And square that one again. Oops, there. So I have now calculated x to the power 16 using four squaring operations. But a squaring operation is just a multiplication of a number by itself. So with this idea, using squaring, I can reduce by a lot the number of multiplications that's done. So let's, in order to exploit this, let's write a new specification which takes this into, advantage, into account. So x to the 0 is 1 as before. And now we have x to the power n is, and now we have two cases, whether n is even or odd. So if n is odd, then we have to do like before. And we have the same definition as before. When n is bigger than 0 and n is odd, notice that this rule is very similar to the rule that we have in the original specification, but we will add now a third rule, which is like an optimization, is like a short circuit. In some cases, we can do much better. So in this case, we will have another rule. We will have y squared, where y is equal to x to the power n divided by 2, and this works when n is bigger than 0, but also when n is even. Otherwise, we cannot divide by 2 and get an, an integer. So we have this third rule here, and with this third rule, we get an, an advantage. We use many less multiplications than the original specification. So let me now make a second implementation. Remember the first implementation here uses the, the naive specification. Now let me make a second one. Then we'll call it pow2 x to the n. Again, if n is equal to 0, then the result is 1. Now I have two cases though. Uh, if n mod 2 is equal to 0, then so this is the case when n is even, then I introduce local y in y is equal to power of x. What do I write here? n div 2, right? Is that right? I have missed something. I have to actually do the, the multiplication. So notice that I have defined here x to the power n div 2. I call it y by introducing this local identifier, and then I return y times y. This corresponds to this rule here, okay? The third rule. And now the final case, let me make a comment here. n mod 2 is different from 0. So in the case that n mod 2 is different from 0, I have to use the rule as before. I have to say x times pow2 of x n minus 1. Uh, here I have to put in a 2, of course. So I have a little bit more complicated definition now, but it's going to be much more efficient. Okay, is this definition correct? What do you think? Notice I have here a new keyword elsif, which is useful when you have nested if statements. Now that's the only new thing, and that I use the local to introduce the y. Now let's try pow2 
2 to the 10. Again, I see 1024. Okay? So now we have the second definition, which is in fact much more efficient. But still, we have one more step to do. We now need to make it tail recursive. Okay, so the invariant. We have to find the invariant. Well, let's say our invariant will be the following. x to the n is equal to y to the i times a. Again, it's very similar to the factorial. We have a part of the calculation still to be done and a part that's already done. So in this invariant, we have introduced three new variables, y, i, and a, and x and n in the context of the invariant are constants. Huh? It's the x to the n we want to calculate. So we can represent the invariant as a triple. We, won't, we don't need to write it over and over again. In fact, there's only three variables here that are important. The invariant gives us the relationship among these three variables, and we can capture this relationship by simply writing it as a triple. Okay, and now we have the decrease increase step. These are transformations of the triple. So y i a becomes, for example, y times y i divided by 2 a if i is even. This corresponds to the third rule of the specification. Do you see that? We have divided i by 2, i over 2, and then since we've divided i by 2, we only have a power that's half of before. We have to bring in y squared. Okay. The other rule is y i a becomes y then i minus 1 and then y times a oops a if i is odd so if i is odd we decrease i by 1 so we've reduced by 1 the power of y so we have to bring in a y here so we bring it in into the a to keep the formula true so the triple if it's true for y i a is also true for the second case here and the third case here okay and then if the initial case is what? Well, the y value is equal is going to be x, the i value is going to be n, and the accumulator is 1. And the final case, when we get the result, is going to be the x does not change, but the n value becomes 0, and the result a is going to be the answer. Okay? With this now, we can, still, we can actually write our new version. Let me see if I can keep the previous version at the same time on the screen as this one. So you can compare them. Let me remove this. So, POW3, this particular one will have three arguments. What are the three arguments? Well, they're the three variables that we introduce in the variance, y, i, and a. Okay, so what's the final uh, case? Well, when i is equal to 0, then the result is a. Else, if i mod 2 is equal to 0, it's kind of like before, uh, then if i mod 2 is equal to 0, what do we do? Well, we have the recursive called pow3, and now and now we use the rule, this rule here. Y i a becomes y squared i divided by 2 and a. So here we say y times y. i divided by 2, it has to be div 2 because it's an integer. And the a is the same. And the final one here is the third rule here. Sorry, the second rule here. It's y. The y does not change. We have i minus 1 as the second argument and y times a as a third one. Okay, so let me bring this into a smaller number of lines to make it take less, less space. So here is now the POW3 function. Now let's see how it works. So the initial value of y, let's do 2 to the 10 as before, 
210 and the initial accumulator has to be 1. So again, we get 1024. So you can compare now these three definitions here. The first one, very inefficient because it's not tail recursive and it's using a naive way of doing powers where you count all of the powers. Then we have the second example, which is smarter in the algorithm of counting the powers because it takes advantage of squaring, but it's still not tail recursive, so it has a growing stack size. And then we have the third version here, which is the most efficient version, which uses the smart way using the squares and which uses tail recursion. So this particular third one then is our final definition of power. And we know it's correct because of the way we built it. We don't have to prove that it's correct. It is correct by construction. Now what do you think? No? It's elegant, no? It's elegant. Very elegant.